<laughs> they want to go for a run. That's right. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Got folks trickling in here. Good to see some new faces and familiar faces. Uh, I see all of my network people there in as guest, 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 guest. Lots of <laughs> lots of guests. All right, we have Michelle, Nancy. Yeah, tell us where you're coming in from. I'm Raleigh. I'm coming in from Corvallis, Oregon. Uh, Zach, are you in Oregon right, right now or are you still in Montana? Still in Montana. Still in Montana. Cool. A little delayed. No worries. Now, this is very exciting. We we're just going on. This is the first legal case webinar we've done about protecting groundwater. So this is going to be really kind of groundbreaking and now I'm, I'm just ex excited. We've done most of what we do is about regenerative agriculture, but this is going to be about protecting water. So this is fun. All right. So we got Jim, John, Juanita. Yeah. And uh, if you're new to this, you know, of course, we have a chat box down below that you can uh, say hello to people. Make sure you enter um, when you're speak, trying to speak to everybody. Click on to everyone so that everyone else can see your chat. Otherwise, you can chat one on one with people. You know, send them send them your information, email, numbers, et cetera, et cetera. But this is going to be. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you tune into a Zoom session, so you know how it works. But just in case, great. We got Sheila coming from Sparta. Nice. Uh, Paonic, Colorado. Keith from North Carolina. Carol from Madison. Nancy from Bethesda. Uh, San Rafael, Austin, New Mexico. San Rafael, Cheyenne, Bullhead City, Livingston, Montana, Whitefish, Cool, Irvine. Nice. So it sounds like we have the states well represented here. <laughs> Django, no. <laughs> All right. Cool, everybody. Well, it's almost 10, so we can kind of get this show on the road. So welcome back to Water Stories. My name is Raleigh Latham. I'm joined by... Zach Weiss, oh, sorry, dog's chewing on his little chew toy in the background. So uh, if we wanna make sure, so you can focus on this, turn off the distractions in the background, try not to browse, be browsing on your phone because you really want, if you're concerned about groundwater and protecting water resources, put your full attention to it because you're gonna get in, you're gonna get out what you put into it. So, um, yeah, we're going to get started. This is all about protecting groundwater. Now, while most of our webinars are focused on regenerating, restoring the water cycle, um, restoring ecosystems, this is about protecting what we have and how we can do that in a, in a landmark case study for people who are protecting our groundwater. So I'm really grateful to have them on, and Zach can give Reba and James an introduction here. Yeah, thank you, Raleigh. So this is a really interesting case that they have going on. It's an active case in Wyoming, um, and Reba brought this to my attention. She's an attorney licensed in Wyoming and New Mexico, and she's a rancher's daughter, has a real love for the land, and she's been working on these different cases, in this particular case, representing a number of different stakeholders in the community and trying to protect the Oglala aquifers. Um, so this is a really interesting case going on, a really seminal case in our water law in how we're going to manage our groundwaters. And so it's really exciting and an honor to bring you on today, Reba. Reba. Thanks, Zach. Can you see me? Yep. Do I hit share screen now? Yep. Yep. So you okay, can go for yeah, it. get started. Okay, so my name's Reba Epler. I'm, I'm an attorney in Wyoming. I'm also licensed in Colorado soon and New Mexico. Reba, sorry to interrupt. Did you mean to share your screen or because- I did. Okay, we can't see it. Zach, can you see it? Because I can't see the- No, you might have one sorry. more. There you I go. I got it. There we go. Now we're good. Okay, sorry about that, guys. So anyway, I'm the attorney that represented at least 10 of the 17 contestants in this groundwater case. And Jim Pike is also a contestant. He's from Cheyenne, and he was an expert witness in our case. Um, let me give you an overview of where this took place. So that's a picture of Jim Pike. Stan Leak is a 
world-class hydrologist. He was supposed to speak today, but he had some health challenges, so he couldn't talk. But that's Stan with some cattle out on a ranch um, at one of the springs that we're trying to protect. And that's me. So where we are is Cheyenne, Wyoming, a, a little bit north and east of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And if you find that star, you can see that Horse Creek is right there and it runs into the North Platte River. So back in 2019, a family applied for this gigantic groundwater development for farming. And, um, but we have some questions about whether the real intent is farming. But anyway, we, my family and along with 17 ranchers, farmers and landowners contested these groundwater permits, which is a remarkable number of people. Um, just to put it in greater context for you, you've got the High Plains Aquifer, which is also referred to as the Ogallala Aquifer, and it's huge. It goes all the way down to Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, and South Dakota. And in the southern part, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas, they've, they have drilled that aquifer and they have depleted it majorly. And we just don't want that to happen in, in Wyoming. And it already has to an extent in Eastern Laramie County. So the wells, there were eight wells that the Lurwick family applied for. And you can see we put these large red dots where the proposed wells would be in the county. Um, and Cheyenne is right there down, the, down there. So we're not too far from Cheyenne, but the water that will be affected by this is Horse Creek and the North Platte River. So this is a schematic, like a cross section of the land. And you can see how the land form up on top is where they wanna put these is right there at the very edge. I don't know if you can use my mouse, but it's right there on the very edge of that huge cliff. And this is a dr dramatized, exaggerated drawing, but it just shows you how the land is up there on top and then it dramatically drops off into the Horse Creek Valley. So where they wanna put these wells is right there at the very edge of that cliff, essentially. Um, the Lurwick family is a farming family from Southeastern Wyoming and they applied for eight wells. And these wells are abnormally large. Normally a center pivot is about 120 acres. Is that right, Jim? Yes. So about 120 acres. So you can see that the size of these are grossly exceeding what a normal center pivot would be. You've got 240s, that's a little bit less than a half section. 480s, that's three quarters of a section. Then you get into the 630s and the 712s, the 720s. Those are those are um, bigger than a section. And there is you can't run a center pivot in this country that's that large. There are center there are center pivots that can go a section, but the land in this area is so rough and so rugged that you could never put one of those pivots up there. So what they would have to do is purchase two pivots per section or sometimes four pivots per section. And right now pivot runs about $110,000 new, probably more. That was last, that was when I checked on that price, it was last year. I bet they're about 140. Would you not agree, Jim? They're higher yes. now because the steel's yeah, not like up. Yeah. So when we checked, they were 110,000 a piece. So in pivots alone, you're talking a million dollars. And that doesn't count the price of drilling and casing and all that stuff. So this is this is abnormal. And where, where it gets even more abnormal, the volume of water that they want, 4,600 acre feet of water, it, it amounts to 1.5 billion gallons of water a year. 1.5 billion gallons is enough to water 15,000 people in a city, maybe more. I mean, 15,000 if, if you use a lot of water. So we're talking about enough water to water a small town. So in Laramie County, Wyoming, in Wyoming, what they have is this law called conservation um, areas, control areas. And what that means is that the law allows the government to impose restrictions on drilling because, because of past problems they've had with groundwater drilling. So if you see this map, you see the area called conservation area and the areas that are known as drawdown areas those are areas where the state has prohibited 
any further development. Unfortunately, we're not in one of those areas, we're in the conservation area. So in the conservation area, the state has said that you can put a center pivot every one and a half miles or a well larger than 25 gallons a minute, um, one and a half miles from other high capacity wells. And that doesn't really do any kind of protection for the streams and I'll show you that in a minute, but this, this is a control area. So keep that in mind that these rights are being applied for in a control area. They established it in 1981 and they modified it in 2015. Um, excuse me, I've got, I got a sneeze. Um, the reasons for establishing your control area, this is from our statute. The use of underground water is approaching um, or equal to the current recharge rate. Groundwater levels are declining or have declined excessively. There's conflict between users or conflict is foreseeable. The waste of water is occurring or may occur and other conditions exist or may arise that uh, require regulation for the protection of the public interest. So these, these conditions existed and our state engineer, old state engineer, Pat Terrell stated in 2012 that the goal of the control area is to protect the interests of existing appropriators for, by providing a regulatory framework to address the reasons for which the area was formed. The Laramie County Control Area was formed in 1981 to address declining groundwater levels and related conflicts. Water level measurements indicate that additional significant withdrawals of groundwater would produce detrimental effects on water levels throughout large areas of Eastern Laramie County. Well, I would say that 4,600 acre feet is a very large amount of withdrawal. So you can see the state is already kind of conflicting with itself in its statements. In order to be granted a groundwater right in, in a control area, you have to satisfy this statute. This is 413932C. You have to prove that there are unappropriated waters in the proposed source, that the proposed means of diversion or construction are adequate, that the location of the proposed wells does not conflict with any well spacing, or well distribution regulation, and the proposed use would not be detrimental to the public interest. Those are the four elements of the statute that you have to prove. The two that I'm going to talk about are whether there's appropriable water and detriment to the public interest. But in this statute, you'll notice that the state engineer has to consider the advice of the advisory board. Well, the advisory board is an elected board consisting of five members and the board held a meeting in September and held, they voted four to one that the there is no appropriable water. And that one person on the board that voted for it was actually the applicant, the Lurwicks. And they allowed the Lurwicks to vote, which is unprecedented. They have always required the applicant to step out of the room when they, when they make these votes. So this is a really abnormal situation where the state absolutely dug in their heels against us. And um, this, the advisory board, aside from Tyler Wick voted four to one, that they should not grant these water rights. And they sat through the trial and they had to listen to the whole thing. So they were there to understand the case. So the, here's the status of the contested case. The Lurwicks applied for these eight wells in 2019, about June. And then they had to publish those in the paper and the neighbors read the, read the notices and all the neighbors were very concerned. And that's not typical of farmers and ranchers to jump up in arms to oppose something that their fellow rancher is going to do. So just the very fact that so many people opposed it should, should indicate that there's a lot of concern about what these wells will do. They had to hold, not hold the trial in 2020 because of COVID. So it was continued for over a year. They finally held a three-day trial in the Capitol in Cheyenne for, in June. Then, like I said, in September, the advisory board got together and voted four to one that they should not grant any of these permits. They should deny all of them. So then this was a really troubling day. I was down in New Mexico getting ready to do Quivira and I got this email and it said, and I don't know how you felt, Jim, when you saw this, but it said, we're proposing to grant all of these wells. And it was an 85 page proposed order. And it was um it was really hard on everybody. I know like our contestants read it and they were just like, oh, we can't believe we had to go to all that work for this. So the law allows for 
everyone to respond to that proposed order. And we did, everyone responded that the proposed order is absolutely wrong. And I, I will stand here all day long and tell you that that proposed order is absolutely wrong and it should not be adopted. So we filed our responses in December and right now the state engineer hasn't done anything. And um, I'd like to make a point about that. There's been three different state engineers during this case. So in 2019, when they started this, there was one state engineer who was an interim then they appointed another one. He quit on December 1st of 2021. And so we've been through three state engineers and now two hearing examiners. So there's been a lot of turnover uh, in that office. In response to that proposed order, my group got together and we worked with one of our legislature, legislators who's in our lawsuit. He's one of the contest, contestants. And we proposed a law change to make it make the burden of proof on the applicant because this 85 page order says that the burden of proof is divided between the applicant and the contestant. It was just bizarre. So we said, absolutely not. If you're going to apply for something like this in a control area, then you had better be prepared to satisfy all those elements beyond a reason, not a reasonable doubt, beyond a preponderance of the evidence. So now on July, on July 1st, this law comes into effect that the burden of proof is clearly on the applicant so that um, those people, like all these ranchers, won't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on experts and attorneys to protect what their senior water rights. It's a totally, it was totally backwards how they put the burden on us. We had tremendous support from Wyoming Stockers Association, the Wyoming Wheat Growers, Farm Bureau Federation, Powder River Basin Resource Council, Cheyenne Area Landowners Coalition, and numerous other residents and large landowners in the area. So we had tremendous support. And this was on the front page of the paper on March 22nd. So it was a great day for us to see that we had were able to change the law. We had it, the stars aligned for, for us. And I think it's gonna benefit everyone in the future because we can't be allowing people to apply for water rights without having a lot of evidence to demonstrate that they're not going to harm others. This is um, myself. John Eklund is next to me and he brought the bill. He's a legislator, but he's also a contestant. That's Governor Mark Gordon. He signed it. That's Jim Pike. And that's Casey Epler, my dad. So that was a, that was a good day. We were really happy that we got him to sign that bill. The reason that we're worried about these water rights being granted is one, impact to senior surface water rights. In the West, there's the doctrine of prior appropriation that says that you can't impair senior water rights. Two, springs, and some of these springs were not permitted, but the ranchers, to their credit, owned the head of the spring and didn't always understand that groundwater and surface water is hydrologically connected and that they should be applying for water rights. So that, that this has come to their attention and they have been applying for water rights on those springs. Then you've got senior preferred water rights which are stock and domestic wells that are in the vicinity that are gonna be dried up and force people who have ranches and small house wells to redrill those at great expense to themselves. We're worried about harm to the public interest. We're worried about the environmental impacts of this. We're very concerned that they're, this is just a classic resource grab and that they're doing this nothing for nothing more than speculative speculation of groundwater and to have a monopoly in the area because of the one and a half mile spacing you can't get a water right next to them so they kind of create a monopoly and then like Zach always talks about these drying up of waters how it creates how it affects the climate so I am very concerned about that um, I don't think that we want to be drying up our remaining springs and streams I, this is to introduce you to our contestants this is Alan Kirkbride he was he was our greatest champion this is him above Horse Creek. It says, may the horse be with you. And I like that because it's Horse Creek. So Alan was a, a genuinely amazing person. He died right after the legislature um, passed our bill. So he worked really hard on this case and he got, he was the glue of this case. And fortunately we have other people in the community that are taking his role and, and, and continuing to hold the community together on this. But I have to give Alan props right now. Um, this is Horse Creek and this is north of Alan's place. But you can see it's amazing creek and that is a majority spring fed creek. 
<laughs> so we're talking about a pretty good amount of water that's gonna be impacted by these wells. This is the Petch Ranch, just old, old ranch. And this is one of the girls that's in that family, Kaylee Wilson. This is Little Horse Creek. This is another creek that's going to be impacted. And we took drones out and we flew with Peter Arnold. He was an old judge from Cheyenne and he's concerned about this case too. So he volunteered his time drone, taking drone footage with us. Like, look at these springs. The water just literally comes out of the hills. And this spring doesn't even have a name, but I would, I've been to this spring a lot of times. And every time I go, I get down there and I drink right out of the wall because it's like, what a treat and the water tastes good. But this is what's at stake. We're talking about affecting 100 and plus year old ranches and families that are established and produce a lot of food and fiber for the state of Wyoming. This is Alan Kirkbride talking to a reporter explaining this little creek behind him, Sprager Creek. It's a spring creek that's gonna dry up with these wells. This is the Sprager Creek Valley and you can see that windmill up there in the right hand corner. And if you look right above that, above where the hill is, those wells are proposed to be right up there on top of that hill, essentially. So everything in that valley will be dried up by these groundwater wells. This is Dally Rutledge, her grandpa, um, Tim Rutledge is one of our supporters. And this spring is called uh, Donahue Springs. And back in the eighties, some people had drilled wells up on top five wells and they pumped the wells for only four or five years, but, and it became too, too expensive for them to run the wells because the water, you have to pull it from a depth of about 300 feet. But in that short time, they managed to dry up this spring, another spring, and there's some other neighbors down the line that said that their springs went dry. And they used to have a hydraulic ram out of the spring that, that um, pumped water to their house that stopped working when the, when the springs went dry. So we know that the Lurwicks are gonna affect these because there's been wells in the exact area that have done the exact same thing. And that's, that's concerning to us. We had a really special day. It was so windy, you can't even imagine how windy that day was. With um, Arapaho, Shoshone and Navajo tribes and they came to a, a really neat ranch and this is a beautiful stone circle and they hadn't been there and hurt, you know, like 150 years probably or more. So they were really happy to get back to the land and to this really sacred spot. And we had a wonderful day with them and they've been interested in supporting us. And so we've just created a coalition with an incredible number of people. This is this, you know, this is a picture of the creek and that pile of rocks up there in the right-hand corner is a grave. I don't know how many people have seen pioneer graves, but that's what they look like. When all the wagon trains used to come through, they'd bury people and then they put rocks on top of them. And there's a lot of graves like that in this country. It's just really special creeks worth protecting. So Alan Kirkbride made this point at the hearings for the law change. He said, look, for $75, they have everything to gain and we have everything to lose. And that's not fair. When you have these old established ranches and these old, old water rights, it is absolutely not right to allow people to, this is the application. Look how simple that is. You check a few boxes, you put in where the land description is and pay $75. And if we wouldn't have contested these, they would have absolutely granted them, even without investigating whether they were too close together or not. So that's, this system is not right. The state is not making sure that the applications are technically complete. They're only making sure that they're administratively complete. And so the state is kind of falling behind on its burden to, to, to grant the water rights. They should be investigating and requiring far more evidence from applicants. This is a map from the USGS, just to show you how the groundwater flows. It's a potentiometric surface. Um, and you can see that the water is just naturally flowing in that direction. And the Lurwick wells would e either block the water from flowing that way or lower the water table to the point that the springs and the creeks won't flow anymore. So that you, you can see how close they are. They're right there up on that rim, like I'd shown earlier. And again, here's another, exhibit that we had just to show you how close these are to these all of these creeks will be affected and it's demonstrated by our modeling here's another cross section you can see that these wells what the what they'll do is they'll lower the water table and by lowering the water table you you lower the water table at the spring and you dry it up that's how that works from a 
uh, tech, from a technical standpoint. The groundwater wells create what you call cones of depression. And this is modeling that was done by the, for the state engineer's office back in 2014. This is called the AMEC report. This is the, this is the groundwater impact without adding the Lerwick wells. And you can see down there in the far left corner, those wells are the city of Cheyenne well field. And those have dried up about four different creeks down there. And the ones on the east side of the state of this, of this map are around Albin Pine and Carpenter. And those have dried up all the creeks. So the last flowing creek in Laramie County is Horse Creek, which is the one we're trying to protect. So these ranchers can continue in the valley. This is the modeling that we did. Carolyn um, Lambert from Nearbow Hydrology. She was wonderful. So you've got cones of depression around the well, you get 50 foot of drawdown and th then it goes out. Um, you know, when you get to the headwaters of Little Horse Creek, you've dropped the water table by 10 feet. There's absolutely no way that that creek is gonna flow that anymore. Sprager Creek, same, it's gonna dry up. All those springs in that valley are gonna dry up as a result of this. And this is what will be lost. You'll lose all the hydrology, all the hydration in the Horse Creek Valley. And these water rights were established in the late 1800s, somewhere in the 1880s. Um, and that's not acceptable from a legal standpoint when you're gonna impact senior surface water rights. The state has been very reluctant to acknowledge the hydrological connection between groundwater and surface water, but it is so well established that their own reports show the hydraulic connection and they, they just really want, they really want to ignore that fact. And they have acknowledged in that 85 page order that they, these wells will dry up those springs, but they said just because that, that doesn't mean that the ranchers are entitled to not, to, to us not granting these. And that really concerns us because they're, the impact will continue after the wells are pumped. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So Stan Leak from the uh, USGS wrote, co-wrote this paper with a guy named Barlow. This is an incredibly famous paper. It's been downloaded at least 3 million times and it's cited 400 times in different scientific. So it's, it's, it's very well peer reviewed and it's very well accepted in terms of this is the science. But before water is pumped, pre-pumping conditions, the groundwater flows to the stream. Then you put a well in and you initially take water from storage. It doesn't immediately affect the surface water. So you can see that the water's, and that little cone of depression is starting to form right there at the top. It's lowering the water table. But as you pump, and you continue to pump, you capture groundwater from storage, but you're also beginning to capture it from surface water. And this, uh, this figure D is what you call induced recharge. So you're inducing the aquifer to recharge from the surface water because that cone of depression creates a vacuum. And it's the law of conservation of mass that says that that will pull it back in there. And the, the earth is trying to fill that cone of depression back up so it'll take it from surface. And um, the question is, when you turn a well off, does the stream flow depletion stop immediately? And the answer is no, unless the well is right there on the edge of the river. Depletion from the depletion continues after the pumping stops. In fact, the maximum rate of depletion can occur after the pumping stops. So that's really concerning. Like after they turn these wells off, that's when you're gonna get the maximum rate of, of an impact to the streams. And that really, really concern, why would they grant these? That doesn't make any sense when you're gonna have a continuing impact to these surface waters in the Horse Creek Valley. This, is, this picture, you'll see this over and over again when you start to look at these charts, but you can see that initially pumping begins down here in the far left corner. And over time, water, water comes from storage initially, but then over time, the curve goes up there and, and at some point these cross, and then you start to get water from stream flow depletion. And over time, you get depletion dominated supply from stream flow. So your storage goes down, your water table goes down, your cone of depression gets bigger, and then you start taking water from stream flow. And that's where the water primarily comes from for a lot of groundwater wells. 
this is Lodgepole Creek. And like I say, don't, this, this, we're no strangers to ground, groundwater development, drying up creeks in Laramie County. This is Lodgepole Creek. Some people say it's the longest creek in the United States. I don't know if that's true, but it is a tributary of the South Platte River. And back in, the in 1934, you were getting a stream flow average of 20, almost 20 CFS. That's a really big creek. Jim Pike knows people that were able to fish off fish in that creek. My dad says that when they were kids, they used to go swimming in that creek. And now if you look over here on the left, that's what it looks like now. It's dry. So these, you see that chart, that little dotted line, that's, that is the permitting of groundwater wells. And then you see where it levels off there in 1979 about. That's about the time they created the control area. So they stopped permitting new wells. But even after they stopped permitting new wells, you can see that the creek is completely dry. So you've got this effect of groundwater coming from the surface water, and it's also lowering the water table in general. This is an aerial of Lodgepole Creek, and you can see the cause. You can see those green circles, that those center pivots are the cause of this creek going dry. You know, if you look up here in the very far upper left, it's a barely a trickle north of Burns. And then down below, you can see that they've built center pivots on top of the creek bed. And then down here in Pine, they've built center pivots on top of it. So the creek is gone. There is no more creek left, which is a terrible tragedy considering that 50 years ago, people were swimming in it and fishing out of it. Pumpkin Creek is another example in the vicinity of these proposed wells. This is from the Spear T Ranch versus Kanab lawsuit. Again, you've got these center pivots being permitted and then you see the decline of the creek. And the, uh, that curve, it looks, I just noticed this, but it looks exactly like this picture. So this picture models what happens on the ground. Um, Here's another picture of it. And this is from this really awesome paper that everyone should read called Environmental Flow Limits to Global Groundwater Pumping. It's in the journal Nature and it's just available now. You used to have to go get it from a, a library, but it's open source now. But even, you know, riparian areas in the state of Wyoming only make up 4% of the state, but they provide 80% of Wyoming's wildlife habitat. And currently, back when this paper was written in 19, 20 to 40% of the waters in the United States where there's groundwater pumping are dry. And that is expected to go almost as high as 80%. And that includes rivers. So we're gonna lose our creeks and our rivers to groundwater pumping, which is a silent and invisible killer of our creeks and rivers. You can't see it. You almost can't, you can't figure out where the wells are unless you go, if, you know, you'd have to do some serious research to figure out where they were on the ground because they're so small. They have such an impact. So this is why I'm concerned. I do not want to live in a world where we continue to dry up our surface waters. Our surface waters and our riparian areas are simply too valuable to trade for marginal agriculture. That's, they're, they've become so endangered that, that we can't continue to trade that anymore for, for what is very marginal agriculture. This is a picture of Kansas, 1961. This guy, um, Angelo, this is another good paper. He, he just kind of penciled out where the creeks were. And in 1994, you can see that they're completely gone in Eastern Kansas. That's 1994. And I bet you 2022, they're all gone. You'd be really hard pressed to find flowing creeks in, in Western Kansas at this point in time. And it says in this little thing below, it says that the creek the river, the Arkansas River, now is dry for 100 to 200 miles, depending on the precipitation for that particular year. So we're way, way beyond creeks and we're into our rivers. I just read a study recently that said that the Colorado River, that is going dry and 30% of that can be attributed to groundwater pumping. So I could be more, I think that that might be a low figure. But you can see the Arkansas River is dry in that picture in the upper right-hand corner. So the Wyoming, the Wyoming Constitution provides people with the right of the public interest. The public has a right in the, in the water, how it's permitted. This is a revolutionary concept, and a handful of Western states give a public interest in water. 
And um, this is where you get the prior appropriation doctrine. Priority of appropriation for beneficial use shall be given the better right. First in time, first in right. And then it says, no appropriation shall be denied except when such denial is demanded by the public interest. And this is from that 932C, the permit shall not be granted if the proposed use would be detrimental to the public interest. Well, I don't know how it could be considered to be in the public interest to dry up ranches that are over a hundred years old that have existed, provided livelihoods for people in that area in exchange for granting it to the Lurwicks. And Jim will talk about the land that they're proposing to drill this on. But this, this shows you what happens when you dry up, dry up meadows. You, have, you lose more than 50% of the productivity of the land. The yield goes, so, goes down. And, and um, the Spiriti Ranch versus Kanab lawsuit was basically this guy named um, Rex Nielsen, really nice guy. He fought hundreds and hundreds of people who had pivots above him and they had dried up the pumpkin creek and they did this lawsuit and eventually they settled for money and it you know he he told the story of how like when the creeks were going dry how the wildlife was just dying in mass like turtles were it was so depressing to watch the turtles because they were they were desperate for water and at nighttime they would go over to the center pivots you know, it used to be full of frogs and all those are gone and the fish, just total devast environmental devastation as a result of these center pivots. And we don't want that to happen in the Horse Creek Valley. And we know that it will because there's countless example after example after example of it happening. So it's not like we're saying something that isn't well established. The reason that, um, a per okay, so in Laramie County, Wyoming, in a control area, well, anywhere in the state, really, you can sell water to frack, or you can sell water to the highway department if they're going to build an interstate, or you can sell water temporarily to a city. This, this, this is the temporary water use agreement. And basically, this policy memorandum that was signed in 2012 says that you have to have a well for five years in agriculture before you can, in, before you can enter into a temporary water use agreement with the state and start to sell your water. Well, five years isn't a very long time, and this policy memorandum could change at any moment. So the only thing that's holding people back is this tiny little policy memorandum that says that in five years, five years from now, you can start selling water to frack, you can sell it to hydrogen production, you can sell it to the city of Cheyenne, you can do all kinds of stuff that's way more valuable than agriculture. So temporary water use agreements create a real concern for us because we, we feel that the Lurwick's are doing this, it's speculative. It's just classic land grab style um, resource grabs is what they're trying to do. And in Wyoming, speculation of water rights is illegal. It's detrimental to the public interest. So basically, if you're gonna create a monopoly or you're gonna speculate with the water, the state has got to deny the water rights. And Jim will talk about why these water rights are speculative, but I'll just leave it at that. Speculative water rights are illegal. So in summary, why this matters for everybody, not just people in Laramie County, because if in the middle of some people say 1200 year drought, but I say 12, 20 year drought, in the middle of one of these epic droughts in a control area where the groundwater use is supposed to be controlled, it's supposed to be limited and it's supposed to be reasonable. If a family can apply for eight high capacity wells under those conditions and be granted them, you don't think that outside of control areas that groundwater is going to be commodified and turned into cash much more easily and readily. This, what, this, what this does is this basically promotes out of control groundwater development with no regard for the impact. And that's why in Texas and Oklahoma, Kansas, they didn't have any regard for the impact. They just said, go ahead, drill all those wells. And we don't, we don't care what the impact is gonna be. We don't have that luxury anymore because the impact will impact, will, will dry up the remaining streams. We don't have a lot left. So it's not in our interest to dry up the remaining streams. Everyone in this group who's listening to this talk has a public interest in the water. The state, every state has to manage the water in public trust, but certainly you have a public interest in the water and you cannot allow states to grant water that are 
water rights that are detrimental to the public interest. We want to prevent speculation of water rights, commodification of water. It really should just be used for the purpose that you're intending it to be used for. We do not want to see the de devastating impact to wildlife, wetlands, streams, and springs. We have got to consider future interests and needs. And I spoke last week at the Wyoming Stock Growers to a group of all ranchers, and they agreed with me. They said, I said, we cannot be handing these ranches off to people in the future in such a degraded state. Most people inherited ranchers, ranches in a, in a pretty incredible state. There was a lot of carbon in the soil. All the creeks flowed, so they got these gravy ranches. But over time, through agricultural practices, the ranches have been degraded. So when they go on to the next people, they're severely degraded. And so it makes it more and more difficult for people to make a living. And you have to go to look at two extreme measures to survive on the land, like selling your water for fracking. You know, that becomes one of the only profitable things you can do with that land. Um, and the last point is that we really have to get all of our state governments to begin to administer water in the reality of hydrologic connection. That has been so difficult in Wyoming to get that to be the reality, but I think that's everywhere. I think that every state in the United States has granted water rights that have dried up springs and streams. And the paper, that Stan's paper confirms that. So this matters to us all. It just doesn't, it doesn't just matter in Laramie County. And so that's my picture. I am a licensed attorney in Wyoming and New Mexico, and I'm taking my ethics bar for New Colorado in August. I just took my broker's test for Wyoming and I need to get my application done. So here in the next couple of weeks, I'll be a Wyoming real estate broker. And if anybody has any need for services, I'm very capable of providing anything. If you are interested in buying and selling land in Wyoming, please contact me. If you have any legal things around land, land water, and energy, I'd be happy to talk with you and help, help you. So without, with that, um, I'd like to pass it on to Jim. Oh, sorry, this is Dan Leake. He couldn't be here today. He wrote the famous paper, the most famous paper. It's amazing. Um, and this is, the, this is the paper and everybody should take, print it out and look at it. It's about a hundred pages and you just, it really goes into the science of how this is done. And I highly encourage everyone to read this paper. Stream flow depletion by wells, understanding and managing the effect of groundwater pumping on stream flow. So now I'm gonna hand it off to Jim. And I just sent that uh, paper in the chats to everyone as a link so that you can read that. Thank and thank you. That was awesome, Reba. Really appreciate that. Just such fantastic work you're doing. Um, and our next speaker, James Pike, is retired from the United States Department of Agriculture in 2018. Uh, during the final 10 years of his career, he served as the district conservationist in Laramie County, Wyoming, focusing on soil and groundwater conservation. Utilizing farm bill programs, he was able to reduce groundwater pumping from the Oglala Aquifer by 1 billion gallons annually and restore permanent vegetation on 10,000 acres of highly erodible farmland. Uh, so really amazing work that both these speakers have been doing and really honored to have you up next, James. Um, thank you, Zach. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, you sound great. Okay, good. Now I'm on an iPad and I'm not sure how to move on to the next slide. Just tell, tell me when to go ahead, Jim. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> basically what I'm gonna uh, focus on here is um, in the statute, and Reba covered this earlier, I'm gonna cover the, that the uh, proposed means of diversion or construction must be adequate for the state engineer to, to uh, issue a permit and also that the uh, proposed use would, would not be detrimental to public interest. So um, I think we can go to the next slide. So starting with uh, the uh, application uh, proposed means of diversion and construction being inadequate, <clears throat> the position I took on this was the amount of water uh, applied for in the lower work applications in relation to the area to be irrigated will result in less than 50% of the peak consumptive use of crops grown in Army County. 
and that's uh, determined by uh, peak consumptive use figures uh, are figured by NRCS for for the crops normally grown in uh, Laramie County. So if you do the math, if you take the amount of water they applied for the, and, and design a center pivot to apply that water to the area that they applied for, you come up with the ability to apply two and a half gallons a minute per acre. Okay, but the requirements for the crops grown in Laramie County under irrigation, the peak consumptive use ranges from 5.6 5 gallons per minute to 7.6 gallons per minute uh, in the case of alfalfa. So already you're not, your means of construction and diversion is inadequate. You only, you're not even gonna grow an adequate crop, you're a profitable crop. And uh, then the second part of my argument there is that the uh, majority of the land area uh, described in the Lerbeck applications is comprised of soils that are class three, four, five, and seven. And these are these classes are uh, based on the uh, National Cooperative Soil Survey that's uh, done by and maintained by the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, so when you look at these classes, these soil classes, Three and four have severe and very severe limitations, respectively, to crop production, for crop, crop production. A class, uh, class six soils are generally unsuited for cultivation, and class seven soils are unsuited for cultivation. So, um, already, now, now we, we're, we're talking about applying very valuable groundwater to soils that are mapped by USDA as being having severe to very severe limitations or just flatly unsuited for cultivation. Um, then along with the uh, capability class, you have a subclass and uh, all the soils in the Lerwick applications, are the subclass is E, which uh, indicates that the, the main hazard is the risk of erosion unless close growing plant cover is maintained like permanent rangeland vegetation. Mm. You can move on, Oliva. So this is just a map, the soil map that shows the soils near uh, where the uh, wells are planned applied for and the, the capability classes on the uh, left. So you can see that you, you can't really separate these capability classes out very well because they're so intermingled to, to pick a spot that say was class two soil. Well, it'd be right down in the bottom of a draw where you'd have um, more chance of uh, erosion from uh, from overland flow of water. But basically here you can see that the area is just comprised of soils that just are, have limita severe limitations or are unsuited for crop production. That's my main point. Okay, you can move on. Um, well, in general, in Laramie County, in the area that they're proposing, you know, you have highly erodible, all of its HEL soils, all of Laramie County is defined as highly erodible soils uh, uh, per USDA. Uh, the topography is rough, as Reba mentioned earlier, which adds to difficulty in uh, irrigation. You get surface erosion. Uh, the uh, high elevation limits uh, and low precipitation and the wind are all um, detrimental to crop production. So it's just a uh, real, and then you get a lot of just evaporation of uh, water that never even hits the surface or gets into the soil. So it's just not suited for center pivot irrigation. 
Can I also make the point that just to show how ridiculous these applications are, they want to put the well here in this hash, this, you know, this would be a three quarter section deal and highway 85 runs directly through it. So how are you gonna get a center pivot to run in that upper left-hand corner with that, you'd lose a huge amount of land to irrigate. So that we found that to be a little odd as well that they were trying to just claim every inch of land that they own and put it under irrigation. Can I move on, Jim? Yes, thank you. Okay, I think I've covered this, but it just wanted to repeat it is that these soils are just unsuitable for cultivation or severely limited. And so it doesn't, well, you can move on. Sure. Um, so during the time that I worked for the Natural Resource Conservation Service um, around Wyoming, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of proposals for center pivots because when the government's subsidizing something, then people will take the money as we, we know. And so in Wyoming, you could get assistance for a center pivot on your, on your land. So um, quite often I would run into applications that were just, you know, nonsensical. They did the soils, the water supply, the um, elevations, just there was always some major limitations to putting a center pivot on some of these locations that people applied for. So, and and uh, most of the time, almost, <laughs> I can't think of an instance where I was sure that I was giving the right advice that, that people went ahead and put the pivot on. But uh, the problem is, um, and I'll just read what I wrote here is, you know, when an attempt is made to irrigate soils that have severe limitations or are unsuitable for cultivation, coupled with a water supply that does not meet crop requirements, production will be marginal. The result is the water source suffers depletion, the health of the soil resource is damaged and other agronomic inputs such as fuel, electricity and agricultural chemicals are spent on production, the production that does not warrant the cost. Now, this is not an isolated loss to the farmer as agriculture is not bound by the same economic rules that most privately held businesses in our country operate under. Marginally, marginal and poorly managed farming operations avoid bankruptcy by collecting massive amounts of taxpayer funded crop insurance. This practice is often referred to as farming the government. So I believe this, the state engineer should evaluate groundwater application for irrigation based on predictable science-based outcomes. When the application does not match the science, the SEO should consider the application for agriculture use as a possible scheme to obtain water rights for other future uses. Mm -hmm. Placing restrictions on change of use that can reduce the such schemes. Thank you, you can move on. <clears throat> okay, so, um, I'll try to, maybe I can just narrate this for you. Maybe it'll make more sense. So in uh, 2009, when I first came to Laramie County as a district conservationist, uh, my job was to address the uh, priority resource concerns in the county as identified by local input and work groups. And uh, so some people uh, that own the Jacobson Ranch in, in the northeast part, northwest part of Laramie County came to see me, asked me to come to their ranch. And uh, they had two center pivots that were, uh, the wells were not producing. Well, there was one well, I'm sorry, uh, that just wasn't producing like it had when it was first drilled, which is, you know, kind of how it goes here. Um, and they uh, they were 
concerned not only about the loss of productivity and well and water production of their wells, but they were very forthright and they talked about the that they suspected that they had impacted surface water uh, on neighboring ranches, um, the one and wells as well, groundwater and surface water. And and I was also working with the neighbor, uh, the neighbors, so I kind of was learning their history as well. Um, it was a well located on the Dayton property that had went dry. And then there was a spring approximately a mile and a half northwest of the pivots that was dry. And then the, the, uh, the stream flow in the North Fork of Little Bear Creek uh, north of the pivots was, had dried up as well. Uh, and this was the case when I, when I visited there in 2009. All these three sources of water that had historically provided stock water and domestic water were just gone. So in, it took me a couple of years. I developed this, uh, the, I worked to, uh, at great lengths with, to develop the AWIP program in Laramie County uh, with the support of the state engineer, the county commissioners, and uh, was sponsored by the Laramie County Conservation District. We finally were able to obtain funding to, to deal with the, the drawdown of the aquifer in the, uh, in the county. So Jacobsons were our, our first applicants and they, you know, set the pivots off and, uh, and uh, within, uh, oh, I believe, I don't want to contradict myself here. Um, I think it was three years, yeah, three years, um, the spring began flowing again and intermittent flow had returned to the North Fork of the Little Bear Creek. Uh, you know, that, that thus it re returned historical benefits to wildlife, livestock, and aquifer recharge in the Bear Creek drainage. Um, and then I continued to measure the, the static water level in the well. And um, the last time I measured it, it had come up 21 feet, which we thought was pretty dramatic. Uh, but only figuring that they're, you know, one of these irrigation wells, they'll pump over 30 million gallons of water out of it annually. I mean, that's that's quite a that's a lot of water in in this arid region. So, um, so based on this case study, my firsthand experience with the Jacobson uh, Ranch and their the effects of their pivot on surrounding surface water and uh, and groundwater, you know, I got involved in this case, this uh, Lerwick case, uh, and uh, you know, all the the I'll just read this due to the negative agronomic issues associated with soil and water, as discussed. I I'm not able to accept any explanation or defense that the intended use of groundwater proposed by the Lerwick applications provides any beneficial use to the state and citizens of Wyoming. And this is uh, just a map. Um, the pivots, uh, the Jacobson pivots um, are on the right there. That's the ones that we shut down. And uh, prior, prior to that, the over to the left, you can, they, the, the a Jacobson's ranch well and house well at the time was owned by uh, a family named Dayton. And they had come to me with the issue of, they had lost their water source. And then the spring up to the north, up to the upper right is the one that was dry. And then the North Fork, a little bear creek was also dry. And those have restored uh, flow now. So. It pretty much um, supports what Rebo was talking about earlier about just how pumping groundwater affects surface water. The same scenario played out uh, exactly like that here. Okay. Can I make one point, Jim? Sure. Those, please. well, those pivots are below 
they're downstream from the head of the spring and the well. So that just shows you that cones of depression will go up grade. The direction of flow does not matter when it comes to cones of depression. They will reach out, up, they will go up grade and dry up something ahead above them, which I think yeah. is contrary. You know, like you'd think it would just affect downstream, but it affects something above it too. Yes, thank you. Okay, I just, uh, so as I've tried to point out, the soils within the application area are unsuitable for irrigation as classified by USDA and RCS. That's not just my opinion, that's based on the science that's uh, developed um, over ever since the Dust Bowl when uh, the Soil Conservation Service was first established. Uh, the amount of apply water applied for does not meet the requirement of any crops grown in Norman County based on NRCS irrigation water requirements. And the case, the case study that I just described with the Jacobson Ranch, uh, well on ground and surface water in the Little Bear Creek drainage. And um, so my conclusion uh, was uh, for the foregoing reasons, I conclude the following that the proposed means of diversion or construction are not adequate as the amount of water applied for in relation to the acres requested in the lower applications is inadequate for crops grown in Laramie County, that the proposed use of groundwater is not beneficial use due to the soil classifications that comprise the land units contained in the lower application, the, the applications for groundwater are speculative based on the scientific evidence supporting conclusion statements one and two, and that granting applications for irrigation wells is contrary to the desires of the landowners living in the Laramie, Laramie County control area. And in addition, it diminishes the benefits gained by the AWIP program. Uh, Early on, uh, earlier, uh, Zach had mentioned that we use the AWIP program successfully to reduce pumping by a billion gallons a year uh, annually. And the lower, the lower applications would just wipe that, that uh, successful program out. And that's something that all of you paid for. It was taxpayers' money that, uh, that funded AWIP. So I'm I'm doing this to try to protect the taxpayer's investment and uh, as well as the resource. Hmm. <laughs> um, well, I think Reva can probably sum this up at this point. I don't know what you want to do here, Reva. Um, well, um, I think that what our objective was in talking to everyone is to take this to a broader audience and introduce the case to the to, to more people throughout the country and, and the world to show what people can do when they work together as a community and i will tell everyone that this was not easy this was incredibly difficult but we came together in our group and we grew from from the group that we had so we grew we had developed relationships with ranching organizations, environmental organizations, large ranch owners, small landowners, uh, you name it. And we are open to partnering with more people to get more support for what we're trying to do. And we would love it if people wrote the governor's office an email and said, hey, we heard about this on Water Stories. We don't think it's right that you grant these water rights that are going to affect these ranches and the Platte River and, and promote irresponsible groundwater development. So we want to reach out and grow this movement. We're, Jim and I are obviously open to more work in more projects, helping communities and people in the land. So we want to meet new allies and partners. And um, our story is going to be on national public radio in July in a 10 minute, 10 minute um, thing. And so it's just growing in terms of it's starting to gain national traction. You know, we're getting national attention on this, which is right. I think that what these people did to work together, to, to pay the lawyers and pay the experts and to just stick together as a community through this is remarkable because I tell you, this was not easy. 
and the state really put us through hell. And the more people that we have supporting us and, and this movement is growing, the more difficult it is going to be for the state to ignore the, the growth of our movement. So we really need people to join us and, and let the state know that we we're being supported, not just by wealthy ranches in Wyoming, but there are people all across the United States and the world that care about what we've done. And, and also, if you get a chance to do something like this, I encourage you to do it because you'll never get, you know, once they permit those wells or whatever they're going to do, you'll never get a chance to stop it. So I'm really grateful that Zach allowed us to talk and our contact information is right here. If you want to take a screenshot of that, and I'm sure Zach will like give our information out to everybody, but we are, we're for hire. So think about what you want to do. Fantastic. Uh, thank you both so much. That was just such a clear painted picture of what we're looking at, what what the challenges are and how we can do something, how we can work together as communities. It just gives me a lot of hope that you guys have so clearly put together the evidence. And at the same time, it just blows my mind that the state is not immediately opposed to this. You've painted the evidence so clearly. Um, I know we've got a lot of questions from folks and folks, we're gonna open it up to your questions here um, very shortly. So you can ask your questions in a number of ways. You can use the raise hand feature in Zoom and we'll call upon you and ask you to unmute to ask your question with your voice. You can also enter them in the question and answer um, or in the chat, we'll get to those as well. I know one question I have for you guys just right off the bat, you know, why, why do you think that there's such a differentiation between groundwater and surface water? If someone was looking at doing this to surface water, it would just be so clearly that they'd oppose it. You guys have painted very clear scientific evidence about the connection. Why do you think that dissonance exists and what do you think we we can do about it you should answer that one jim okay um good question i'll try to do it justice um my experience uh, has been of course here in southeast wyoming all of the surface water has been adjudicated there there is no unadjudicated surface water uh in fact the Platte River is known for being probably the most over adjudicated river in the United States. Just so there's there's water rights uh, have, that have been adjudicated to individuals for water out of the Platte River that just the water doesn't exist. Um, so really difficult for someone to get a surface water right in this part of the world. So over time, that concept is pretty well understood. And so they know that they just can't go um, apply for surface water. I had some people uh, during the pandemic that wanted to move to central Wyoming and they were gonna buy a little piece of property next to the Platte River and they called me and wanted me to help them get a water right. And I said, well, you know, we can get you a water right, but you'll never see a you know, a gallon of water. So don't be, don't let a, a real estate agent or somebody tell you that you can buy this land and then irrigate it that, uh, with surface water. Yeah, so, so surface water is just, that, that, that ship has sailed. Um, the, to sort of try to answer the question, but now you have people that, uh, you know, they know they're sitting on top of the Ogallala Aquifer and they know there's water there. They know there's opportunity to turn that water into money. And we just, uh, you know, we thought in, so in the control area for a long time that we had this problem under control with the establishment of the control area. And until 2015, we didn't really worry about it too much, but, but with the advent of, um, um, more demands um, for different sort from different uh, water users. Uh, well, pretty soon they realize, yeah, this water, there is water there in, in Wyoming in the Ogallala. It's not been depleted like in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and Eastern Colorado. So um, 
it's just uh, another, it's just the gold, gold rush mentality. There's something there and you can turn it to money. And, uh, and the state historically has just not been willing to connect groundwater and surface water. So when you over adjudicate groundwater, like we've done in, in Laramie County in the early later part of the last century, no thought was given to how that was going to impact uh, surface water. And until, you know, it's so insidious. Um, slowly, Lodgepole Creek just dries up, you know, but it's over enough time that you just, it, you know, if it happened in a year, well, yeah, you would pay more attention to it. But, but over 30 years, well, it's just pretty soon you come to kind of accept it and um i just wasn't able to accept it and that's why i'm in this fight that uh, if, if you're a wildlife enthusiast it doesn't matter what you um what your concern is here with water um when you dry up surface water the impact is uh you know far reaching and uh, so i'm not sure i'm answering your question but I think it's just a matter of availability. We're, we're down to now where we live here, groundwater is the available source. So I think uh, that's part of the problem or the main, the main part of the problem. And if I can try to answer your question better, I will. No, that, that was great. I mean, that really spoke to the issue is just this overall scarcity and so people are pursuing whatever is available and the the state's making groundwater more available than it should be i think is yes the, that's yeah well said um i think we'll get to uh starting to let people ask their questions with their voice but one just follow up that i'm sure a lot of people are wondering here um from chris not to vilify this family for making these applications but honestly what are their responses to these clear holes in their frankly ridiculous claims that this is going to be for their ag operations? Uh, how do you call them out as clearly being shady while honoring their autonomy as ranchers and landowners slash families? Well, do you want to answer that, Jim, or do you want me to answer then? You should answer it. You're so so soft and so political that you should answer that. <laughs> well, <laughs> Right, I, I, um, that, that is, you know, whoever uh, is asked that question really, really captures the, the heart of this whole issue. Um, so historically, in Wyoming, you know, you, what your neighbor's doing on the other side of the fence, you kind of keep your nose out of it. And uh, that's kind of how we live and try to live, um, don't always accomplish it, but um, it was we went, during the hearing, it was difficult because I worked, I know these people, I worked with them for a long time. And uh, I just thought this is such an overreach with such, um, you know, serious consequences. And none of their, none of their numbers you know, made any sense, like we talked about. And like the person that asked the question obviously figured out right away. Um, I'm afraid and, uh, you know, I'm afraid that it boils down to uh, seeing an opportunity and wanting to cash in on it, uh, go, you know, just uh, that, that bugaboo that we deal with in, as humans, uh, you know, breed. And so there was very little, I don't believe that they in any way answered during the hearing answered um, the questions that that the lack of you know they that the, the science that we were bringing to the hearing there was really no um, rebuttal of it I I think that's probably answers the question I hope right they just didn't answer the question I mean they said we're farmers but uh, well, I mean, they had a pivot that, that set idle for, what, 20 years or something like that, right, Jim? And then when the, the, the good wells were drilled, the good well wells were drilled north of them, 
they started selling frack water and they said, oh man, this is great. We didn't have to farm these. And now we're selling at least a million dollars worth of frack water off of it, one pivot. Then the state allowed them to expand that well to go from 120 acre feet to 315. So what I heard last is they were selling it for 55 cents a barrel. So 320 acre feet of water converted to barrels, that would probably be close to one and a half million dollars a year. Just gravy money. They didn't do a dang thing to earn it. That's the problem is that with these temporary water use agreements, they're really good for farmers because they allow people who've been in marginal agriculture forever to get paid decently for having, you know, slaved away at the center pivot. But, but there's already enough groundwater in Laramie County to sell to frack. We do not need to be granting more wells. If we do, the Lurwicks, their plan will fail because other people around them are already wanting to apply. So they're going to drive the price down of water and pretty soon water will be being sold for 10 cents a barrel. So it's just a massive devaluation of the resource. There's already a scarcity. So it creates an incentive for people who have center pivots to sell water to frack. I mean, that's, that is the reality of it, but what I feel the real the, the reason that they're doing this is one, the city of Cheyenne is growing so quickly. The city of Cheyenne is hunting out water sources. Where can we get more water to grow this population? You know, it's grown to what, 75,000 people in a couple of years since the, what they call the great resignation, all these people moving to the West. Um, then you have to consider, so you have to consider the possibility of this water going to the city of Cheyenne that they would just buy their ranches or take them by eminent domain. The second possibility is fracking. And that's more immediate because in five years they can start sell water frack. The third possibility that really concerns me is hydrogen because everyone thinks these hydrogen cars are so great, but guess what? You gotta break the hydrogen and the oxygen apart. And typically, well, that what they wanna do is they wanna make it from water versus methane or uh, natural gas. You got to put a huge wind farm or power plant near that to have enough electricity to break that bond. So these, all of this fuel that we want to have for cars is going to require a lot of energy. And that's something that we have to consider in all, in all this stuff. One that uses the, the least amount of water is wind. Um, but anyway, um, we don't think that they adequately answered that question. And when the state wrote that 85 page order, they basically said, well, the Lurwicks are farmers. They know what they're doing. But Lori Jackson, one of the people who is on the advisory board said, this looks like a financial disaster. If, if they're not gonna make money off of fracking and they're just straight up gonna try to do agriculture, this will break them because the cost of these wells is in the millions of dollars. And so no one could grow corn at that elevation for um, and make any kind of money with the cost of these wells, really. Don't you think, Jim, there's just no way to make money in agriculture given these, given these factors, the elevation, the wind, the everything. Right, the only, the only out they have is the fact that the taxpayers sub, um, covers their crop insurance and pays them to fail, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Right. So that's, that's what we just think. insanity. I, I, yeah, I loved how you brought that to the table as far as farming the government, because uh, that is something that people will do with these systems in place. And, uh, you know, to think not only that, but then it's wasting this valuable, vital resource. It's destroying the local environment. Uh, I see this in the comments a lot, and I would just want to echo it. You know, I think we all applaud your guys' patience amidst this obvious insanity. Thank you. It's been very difficult. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <right>. yeah. <laughs> you think if this case is successful, it could set a precedent that other states and other people in other states could come together? Let, let's say environmental nonprofits and ranchers and farmers could see that, you know, some people might be exploiting groundwater in a region. Let's say Saudi Arabia is buying up like tens of thousands of acres in Arizona and pumping all the groundwater to produce hay, could they potentially use this case as a way to like 
basically stop groundwater exploitation in other in other places. Uh, yeah, no, this okay. So either way you go, win it or lose it, it creates a precedent. And yeah. that's why we we work so hard on this, right, Jim? I mean, we can see that if the Lurwicks win, we're screwed. The the number of in Laramie County alone, the number of permits that are pending after them is anywhere between 200 and 73, depending on who you ask. The government claims it's only 73, but when we researched it, it was in the close to 200. And one time we looked, it was close to 400. So there is no universe where the aquifer can withstand that kind of development. So if we, if we lose it, there's, you're setting these ranchers up for just years and years of appeals. And I've told them, man, we might have to win this at the Supreme Court level. And I hope we don't have to. I really, really hope and pray that the state agency, the Wyoming State Engineer's Office has some sense because our side is, look, Jim is a farmer. He's not some radical environmentalist. I'm a ranch kid. I am from this area. Everybody in this lawsuit is literally a rancher or a farmer. It's not like they're that any in, there's nobody that joined this contest that has that is an environmental organization or anything so these people are genuinely just trying to protect their ranches their lands their their livelihoods um the the demand for land right now in wyoming is enormous and this as soon as you make it real hard for these ranches to to continue to operate you know what's going to happen they're going to get subdivided you have never seen anything more magnificent than this Horse Creek Valley. It is so remote, so big, so open. There's water, there's grass. It is amazing. It's like a secret gem that most people know nothing about because it's only, you know, big ranches are up there. And um, if the Lurwicks win, we're going to have to continue to go on through appeals and hopefully win at the Supreme Court level. If we, if we win, if the if the side of reason wins, then yes, this will send out a resounding message to the in the Western United States that people are tired of the exploitation of our resources and that you cannot allow one family to control such a huge amount of water and then privatize it and make themselves wealthy to the to and then destroy everyone else's operation. So we're really like, okay. With the trial was going on, I would always text people pictures of the Lord of the Rings, and I would be like, we've, we've almost got the ring into the volcano, and, you know, the eye was the state engineer, and they're like, you know, watching us, and it's truly, we're fighting for Middle Earth right now. This is the battle for Middle Earth, and we have to win. We, we cannot lose. So everyone who's watching this, please support us. Please send a note, an email to the state engineer's office or to the governor of Wyoming or his wife. She's very concerned about food and water. Jenny Gordon, please, whatever you can do, say, I watched this thing, I'm concerned. And where can we, where do people direct that, Reba? Is there a link that we can put in the chats or if you tell yeah, me- I let can, me get you, you the know. governor's, um, his policy gal is supposed to be watching this. So let me get you the governor's, policy people's email address. And if everybody just takes five minutes and writes them an email, it would be so helpful. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of people here that would be happy to. And I'd, I'd like to just add real quick that I think the current governor uh, has been, uh, he was very gracious to us when we got the bill signed that, that clarified burden of proof uh, for groundwater applications. And uh, so I'm, I'm real hopeful that uh, that we're turning the chapter and going to and turning the page and going to have a new chapter in Wyoming of um, you know being a little more <laughs> approaching these things scientifically. Thank you. Yes. Well, it's really cool. This is you think of all of us in the West. This I guarantee this is probably repeating in other places, Colorado, yeah. New Mexico. Arizona, Utah, like this could be a great example of, of a template, of a legal template that could be used elsewhere to protect groundwater. And it's something where the urgency is now, it's super high because 
you look in places that are doing something about it, they're oftentimes putting in legislature that doesn't come into effect for many years, uh, like particularly California with the whole mess there with them privatizing the public water supply for the Resnicks and even the legislature that they put in place isn't going to come into effect until 2030 when the aquifers are going to be mostly gone already. So it's really important that we stand together and really stand against this over extraction of our groundwater supplies, because if we don't, you know, it's dust for us, but even more so for the next generations. Yeah. Yes. So Zach, I put three email addresses in there. Those are the top policy people for the state that can really reach out to the governor. You can't directly email the governor, but um, if you send a message to them, they will, they will convey it to the governor. And um, the governor said to us when he signed our bill that um, his daughter is a hydrologist in California and that she saw the subsidence from the drying up, the drilling of those giant wells there. So he's, he seemed to be real sympathetic to us. He was really good friends with Alan Kirkbride and Lindy Kirkbride as well. So we feel that we're on the side of reason. We really are the side of reason and responsibility and respect for the resource. So it wouldn't be an overreach for us to ask other people to, to send an email to those three people. So if you wanna share those emails, by all means. Yeah, yeah, I just shared those in the chat for everyone and I'm gonna add those to the replay link as well. Um, so that, yeah, when people are watching the replay, you, we make it easy on you to help make an impact in this case. Yeah, and and even James, what might help too is a little bit of a, a a bit of a primer message on that. Like, you know, for example, what you would write the the governor or his wife, uh, the kind of message to write, so so people kind of know what what yeah. the right message okay. to get across to them. I can do that. And, and then, you I know, of course, write it right, right now, or do you want me to? Can I have five minutes to write that up? Oh yeah, so totally. Yeah, you can. can you can it do it after the event, and then we'll include <laughs> okay. that in the replay that we send out to okay. people, so everyone yeah. who's registered gets an email with with that detail as well. Um, um, do we want to do? I, a, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I just want to let people know how you do this. You basically work with your local legislatures and you work with um, you, you work with the government as much as people want to hate the government you really have to develop relationships with with like your county commissioners and with um, with everybody it's all just a business of relationships and there you you would never would have dreamed that this group would have come together but but for this water case and so it's just a matter of relationships and practice you just have to go to those meetings and talk my mom is on the advice like a uh, albany county natural resource committee just to be involved in those things it does take time but it, it is worthwhile to go and to make relationships with all these people i think that's a great point is that you know policy is determined by people who show up people who, who come to the town hall meeting who make their voice heard and so we as concerned citizens really do need to show up for our future resources, for our future livelihoods. Um, we've got, Raleigh, do you wanna ask on a few people to uh, do questions with voice? And then we've got a bunch yeah, of the question sure. and answer as well. So we got two, yeah. And if you asked your question in the Q and A, please raise your hand because we'd love to hear your voice. And so you can ask this, this um, ask your question live instead of just over text. So, okay, here we go. Question from Bryce. Hey, Bryce. Hello. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. First, um, does this uh, new uh, law that uh, places the burden on applicants to show that uh, there isn't an adverse impact on uh, subsurface water. Is it, uh, does it apply to domestic wells or is there a limitation just to high capacity wells? Okay, Bryce, so the, the law only applies to high capacity wells being applied for in control areas. Okay. But we did have some discussion at the stock growers meeting about requiring 
applicants for subdivisions to show what the impact of those would be because presently there's no requirement to show what 300 wells that spaced at five acres apart are going to do to the aquifer in terms of drawdown and quality because they're putting all that dirty water back so we're going to start working on requiring sub developers to show what their impact is going to be as well because those have an aggregate impact it's not just like one well every section it's we don't know what the impact is we really don't i mean the state says that it's a really minimal impact but that that can't be because there are hundreds and hundreds of small wells being built, drilled in around us so that kind of we we're not there yet it just the law presently only applies to high capacity wells in control areas yeah so it's kind of death by a thousand cuts uh, so the other thing that I'm wondering is how uh, this work that, that you're doing, which is very important work, uh, very impressed with your presentation and the science behind it today, how, how does that, or does it at all at this point, uh, transfer to, uh, you know, the proliferation of small volume domestic wells in Laramie County? Well, so somebody was telling me they were so mad about all these houses being built. And I said, well, stop subdividing ranches then. I mean, really, the, it goes down to that, that it's so profitable right now to chop up these big ranches and um, put, put them into small housing. So the issue is bigger than just the housing. It's it's the profitability of agriculture and things like that that are really need to be addressed so that we can save save these landscapes that make Wyoming Wyoming or Montana Montana you know cool appreciate your question Bryce all right so next next one Yvonne I'm gonna unmute you Hey, Juan. I'm gonna ask to unmute. Hi. Hey, hey. Hey, folks. Hi, Reba and Jim. Thanks for sharing your story and um, for all the work you're doing for your neighbors and folks. Um, one question I have is, you know, like you actually had somebody in the legislature that was personally affected by the Lerwick Wells, um, and I'm assuming that he was a, a big ally in helping, you know, pass that legislation. Um, like, what kind of support do you think you would have had in the legislature, or like, what would that legislative gaining that legislative support had looked like? Do you think if you didn't have somebody that was personally affected by this, like, in in the legislature? What do you think, Jim? Um, yeah, I'll try that one. I, that's a good question. And I, th I think it would have been more difficult to get our bill into the committee to start with. Um, so a, a huge advantage to have, you know, and that's the whole idea of having a local legislature. Um, but yeah, it would have been more difficult. Uh, once we got it into committee, we had a little bit of pushback and once we got it to the Senate, uh, I know I personally wrote letters to each, all 30 senators in Wyoming and, and we had a unanimous uh, vote that they all voted yes for the bill. I was uh, almost elated with, with that. But so that to answer your question, I think if, if we didn't have someone in the legislature, it would have been more difficult, in my opinion, uh, to get the bill through, to get it started. And the only thing I could suggest is if you're in that situation and you don't have the support that we had uh, with, uh, with uh, Representative Eklund, then you gotta get somebody um, elected that will give you that access to, you know, to, 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 uh, that's, that's, that's just, it makes the work harder. Uh, I, I get it, but, uh, that's, that would be all you could do at that point to gain the same advantage that wh whatever it was, however you want to measure it, that we had. 
Yeah. And so I'm very happy that uh, John, he really came through for us and, uh, and it's gonna help um, everybody living in control area. And I think it'll eventually help. Uh, it's a property rights issue. And that's what it came down to in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks James. Oh, thanks Yvonne. All right, so next up is Leslie. Hey Leslie. Asked to unmute. Leslie, does, does your microphone work? There we go. All right, got it? Yep. Uh, thanks. Um, this is excellent, by the way, um, um, on multiple levels, and it, the timing couldn't be more um, perfect uh, with everything that's going on in the world, because um, I do a lot of work overseas, uh, specifically over in, the, over in Africa and the um, Middle East. However, a um, couple things, um, and I was thinking about this when you we were talking about, uh, you raised the question, you know, surface water versus groundwater um, and the connection. Culturally, when you think about it, I mean, even in this country, we're used to having free water, right? Um, people turn on the, the tap and it's, you don't pay for it. I mean, it's low in cost. And that's been over a long period of time. A long period of time and then I think of con and I'm giving you concrete examples then of the free water mindset and this perfect I am so glad that she talked about cones of depression because I had put that in the chat and this is something um, I was unaware of until about seven years ago and I talked with a, a, a hydrologist um, overseas about bore b-o-r-e borehole drilling um, <clears throat> over in Africa and and I'm not, a, I'm not a hydrologist, my degree is not in that, but common sense. And I thought if they keep drilling and they keep drilling deeper and deeper and there's no regulations, so everybody sees what somebody else is doing. And all of a sudden you have basically the mind, you know, it, it's instant water. And this goes back to like, no offense, you know, some of the Hollywood celebs as well. I'm, I'm gonna, uh, that they put, they want clean water, but there's no um, regulations, no teaching or training in such a way, and not from our Western mindset either culturally, which is really important uh, about leaving that tap on for, for, for water, for access to that water. So they keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper, hence cones of depression. I've seen this over and over again. So I'm really glad that she brought this up because this is critical. And it's those subtle layers that we're not, well, we're just not even in this country, really not aware, right? That awareness of our surface water, which we're used to versus the groundwater versus the aquifers. And so part of it is education. It's cultural, it's historical, it's geological and you know, being able to relate to farmers and in rural um, ranchers and rural regions, we may think that we have all the answers and make those um, connections, the dots, right? Connecting the dots. But it's another thing to form these relationships. And I know first from firsthand experience, because I've got a um, Tennessee, right? Uh, Middle Tennessee, they're clear cutting everything within two years, it looks like a war zone. I've never seen anything like it because there's no regulations. And of course, that's going to affect all the, um, all the water resources that are, that are available because just like Cheyenne, Wyoming, within a two hour radius south, southwest of Nashville, Tennessee, it's, it's gonna be like Atlanta. Everything has just changed overnight. <laughs> so this is, I mean, it's significant and I can give you some context there. Um, and unfortunately, with the NRCS there, those good old boys, um, and believe me, I go up against it when I first got down there, um, they never even heard of agroforestry or agroecology. And But if you come on them, and I've known this, okay, especially being a woman, come on to a guy that's set in their ways, I don't care where you are in the world, whether it's this country or another country, 
you're going to have a problem. So part of it is you got to be smart. And you were saying, you know, working together, the beauty is where you are in Wyoming, your ranchers, your farmers, you've been there for generations so that you do have an established relationships with people. But if you're coming in and viewed as an outsider, then how do you then earn trust of others that may not think like you? And we have a tendency to be negative, and I use the word deplorable, and I really hate that word because it, it puts a lot of people, they're not stupid. These people are not stupid. Most, you know, they're hardworking people. So then it's how do you work through these relationships? And they do take time, but if you don't, if you come at them too hard, kind of like an all or nothing, you're going to get nowhere. And I've learned this too, because us as Americans, culturally, we tend to be, I'm guilty of it. Um, we want it, you know, we want it now. We And we think that we're right and everybody else is wrong. And that won't get you anywhere. Leslie, real quick, just for simplification, could you, could you boil that like down to a question? I know sure. you kind of you kind of got to it. But. Right. So, well, you were talking about, you know, why, why don't people get, why don't people understand the connection between surface water and groundwater and aquifers? And, and I think he's answered that. And so what is it about our culture or culture of other countries and history and geology? How can we present that in such a way uh, to form healthy working relationships in a community that we may not have been there for generations. We may be the outsiders coming in. How do you, how do you establish those, those networks and how critical is, uh, is, is that? The other second question is who owns the water rights when an aquifer extends into several states? Can I answer the second one first? Sure. Okay, so every state owns the water. The people of the state own the water. And the state's job is to administer that water for, the, for beneficial use. And so the state owns the water. And then if you acquire a water right, you acquire a right to use the water. You know, you don't actually get to, you don't ever own the water. You only own the right to use the water. When it goes to another state, it becomes the property of that state. And in fights between two different states, the doctrine of prior appropriation determines who's got the older water rights. And so um, the age of the water right has everything to do with who's going to win the water fight in the West. In the East, there's a doctrine of uh, riparian rights, which I don't know anything about because I'm not from the East. And then the second, the first question was about how do you do this if you're not from a place? Well, I want to tell the story of the Albany County, which is a county in Wyoming, about the creation of this um, groundwater protection plan. The, there was a group that came together and formed a protection plan for the aquifer, which I think is remarkable. It does sort of limit development on that aquifer, too, in terms of septic tanks and things like that. So I think a lot of those people... We're from Laramie, but there are also people that weren't and they just got together and they, they, they stuck with it and they had drinks all the time, you know, like come have a beer and learn about the aquifer kind of thing. And eventually they got a favorable county commission to pass the aquifer protection plan. So it just requires hanging in there and making relationships. That's really all that it, I can say is that it just requires that. Thank you. Yeah, and to add on top of that, one of the pieces I've seen be really effective is to start with the concerns and needs and goals of the community members, uh, making sure that they feel very heard and represented and that their concerns are the concerns at the root of the dialogue. Uh, and I've seen that be very effective as well, as far as getting divergent communities onto the same page and, um, having some amount of buy-in from various stakeholders. Mm -hmm. I guess Great Bear Rainforest is a, a, they had a great case study, the Bioneers talk where it was from the Greenpeace perspective, how they went into an outside community and they had to partner with loggers and indigenous groups to actually like over five years of negotiations actually get to the point where 
they all felt like they got enough of a good common agreement that they would protect the Great Bear Rainforest against like, you know, clear cutting. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, thanks, Liz. I appreciate your questions. All right, next up, let's go to, let's see, Jonah or Ben? Let's go with Jonah. Hey, Jonah. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Great. Awesome presentation. Uh, it'd be great if we could get some of these slides and stuff somehow. Um, I don't know if you sharing that. Yeah, I can share the PDF for sure. Yeah. And also too, if, if any of you like, I know like this is too much, this is too much of a tech hack, but you know, you, on a replay, you could also do screen screenshots like and just take screenshots on your computer. But for some people who it's like, that's too much tech nonsense. It's a, uh, yeah, a PDF, we could send that to you. Mm -hmm. But sorry to interrupt, go ahead, Joni, you're asked, you're in the middle of a question. Yeah, it, it kind of flows nicely with the, conversa the conversation that's been happening. Um, I just feel like I, I always see this um, kind of like a framework of war. It's almost like you're building relationships with the community, but it's always a battle against something that's happening with our water. And, um, and in that way, it takes a lot more energy and usually takes longer. And I feel like there's this other approach of making it almost like a party or a gathering where you're inviting people to something better, uh, like a different way. And I feel like the root problem of a lot of the things we've been talking about comes with our relationship with water and the culture we have. And it seems like um, center post farming or, or I forgot the name of it already, but uh, it seems like just our farming in general does not work with our water. And I know that building that hydrological connection works. Uh, it's like a really good starting point to helping us think through different ways to do this, different ways to farm, different ways to ranch, different ways to live. And I was just wondering, um, outside of just in, informing people of the connection between surface water and groundwater and hydrology in general, yeah. what kinds of solutions are being talked about in these cases and these situations? Well, thanks, Jonah. Well, I think that, um... The, we really have to evaluate granting more water rights, more groundwater rights. That's, I don't think there's a place you could go in the United States and drill water rights that wouldn't affect surface water. So unless you find some deep confined aquifer, but aside from that, I don't know. I think that this was the right step. This was the right thing to do in this case, which was to oppose these water rights. And um, I don't, I don't know. I've thought about that as well. Like what, how do you go beyond the conflict? And so you're not in this conflict. I mean, I kind of like war. It's, it's intriguing to me, but, but I would also like to not be in war. It's too stressful and too hard on everybody. So the way I see about I see it is to change the law. Um, one of the laws that I'd like to see changed is to allow a state engineer to be something more than just um, an engineer. I think that New Mexico tried to pass this recently, but they wanted their state engineer to be a geologist, hydrologist, attorney, um, and or there was a fourth one. Agronomist. And I think go, agronomist. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Why don't we make it so that the person who's in charge of all this water has more depth of understanding than just an engineer. Um, because the state engineer kept arguing back to us, well, we don't, we just don't understand this stuff that you're saying. And it's like, you don't understand hydrology. And the answer is no, they don't. They don't even, they, they have lost their last hydrologist in that agency. So we really need to look at these agencies and help them. I will tell you that the state agents, the, state engineer they they definitely wanted to war with us you know they did not want to work with us or listen to us or collaborate with us um 
So we really need to work on that culture. How are we going to build a relationship with the state engineer's office after this? I don't know. It's going to take some real work. Um, I guess that's probably what we need to work on next is, is working with building a relationship with the state engineer's office rather than being at war with them. Um, that's what I'd say. Yeah, I, I agree. I'd like to just add real quickly that uh, if I may, I agree with the, the question uh, the, that uh, look for other means of dispute resolution rather than to have to get into this uh, fight. But so to, to let you know uh, from the beginning, I, in the very beginning, when they applied for these permits, I contacted the uh, applicants to try to negotiate and, uh, you know, sit down at the table and, and look for a way out of this that uh, may not be, uh, may not impact uh, other users and surface water because I'd known what was, had happened at the Jacobson Ranch and I knew that this would be the same result. And I, I just, unfortunately, I got nowhere with that approach. Um, it's just probably too much money involved here. So, but I agree, it'd be nice to always try that route first and not just immediately go to war. But, uh, and, and I tried, but failed. And I think one of the big themes here too that we're kind of dancing around is what we really need to move towards is people with the decision-making power having actual relationships with that landscape, with that place. We're increasingly getting to a point where the people who are deciding about water rights and land use have no relation to the places they're deciding about. And then you inevitably can't make good decisions that actually serve the place and the people. Um, so the more we can put that decision-making power in the hands of the people with relationships to that place, I think that's gonna really help as well. We've begged the state engineer's office to come out to the land and look at these springs. We tried to hold a day of the trial on the land to go look at the springs. Um, we've tried repeatedly to get them to come out and do, it, do this. And, and we feel that, that they didn't take advantage of that opportunity. And every time that we try to talk about this in front of the state engineer's he says, oh, I can't listen to this because I have this active case going on. So it just seems like it's really troubling to me that he won't listen. It's not like I'm presenting anything we didn't talk about at the trial, you know? So we've just seen this pattern that they'll just dart out of the room anytime we start trying to talk about, talk about this. So to, to, to build a bridge with that agency is gonna be the next challenge. Don't you agree, Jim? The next thing we have to work on is to build a bridge with those people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Nice. Appreciate the question, Jonah. All right, we're going to probably just do one more question. However, I just want to remind everybody, let me go on water stories real quick, that this webinar and all the others we've done are available for, for free on the water stories community. So if you like really like this, want to continue the conversation, you just go to, uh, we'll post the link, but it's the Water Stories community. So waterstories.com, you click on community, and then, you know, you can sign up for this for free. And all the replays are here. So this is all the replays of web previous webinars we've done, along with a ton of other topics that you can chat about, meet other people working on different avenues in water, whether it's beaver restoration or pond building or, or agroforestry, it's all there. So give it come join us if you haven't yet and if you have uh would love to hear your thoughts on this conversation because this is where we're going to repost the replay here along with an email so a little primer just in case you haven't heard that before so we're going to have take the last question from ben and then we might call it a day and then send a replay lit later hey ben how you doing Hi, thanks for the presentation. Uh, great presentation from everybody. Um, so I, I don't want to get too bogged down in my particular situation. I was hoping that maybe it could, uh, there's more uh, broadly applicable, you know, answer to this. Uh, I've got a neighbor who, you know, needs to, who's got a well that's technically uh, uh, kind of right on the boundary between our land. So I might have some, you know, legal rights to having set, uh, some 
intervention in, uh, and because it, it is up, it, it, while it's on the other side of ridge, it, it would affect the groundwater that feeds the spring, that feeds our house. But um, really, I mean, he's a nice guy. We've had good relationship as neighbors. I'd hate to, to really make his life harder and then bring us both all these expenses. And then as they were talking, and so as um, in addition, they were just talking about these multi-million dollar wells. Uh, it seems to me that there's got to be, uh, you know, Zach, you, you might have some insights like uh, permaculture and other, or, you know, water management techniques that could really be much more cost effective than these bore, boring wells that are, you know, uh, inevitably going to fail and sediment up and draw everything. Anyway, as, as we all probably know. So uh, that's really what I was at wondering. Is there, are, there, are you kind of like smacking your head or your face? Like, why aren't they doing X, Y, Z that say Sepulcher might do? Or what would Sepulcher do in this situation? I guess <laughs> kind of belines my question. Yeah, really good question. Um, you know, just to speak to that briefly, I, I think there's so many things that can be done as far as better, certainly environmentally friendly agricultural practices. A lot of times they require a short term cost for a long term benefit. And we're so used to a short term benefit for a long term cost. Uh, when you look at like, you know, these center pivots, yeah, it does great for the first handful of years. And then as the aquifers go dry, the system eventually fails. So there's lots of ways that we could move in a different direction. But then <clears throat> there's also some friction in that a lot of these methods actually entail impounding surface water, which are then again infringes on these downstream older rights. So we're in kind of mm -hmm. the situation where it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you do the practices that will heal the land and recharge the aquifer, you're going to have legal cases against you by the senior water rights saying you're impacting their water rights. And if you extract the groundwater, you're going to be able to do it today, but you're screwing over the future generations. Um, so it's I think that's where we really need this paradigm shift where we start to realize this is all one water supply and it's not just a resource to be used, it's something to be recharged as well. So we can actively recharge these resources if we put the time and energy into it, but we need to start prioritizing recharge instead of just downstream flow. Right now, downstream flow has all the, the legal prioritization. Um, and I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that as well, uh, Reba and James. What do you think, Jim? Well, so that was the, uh, I wore a couple of hats uh, as the district conservationist here. I worked on groundwater conservation, but my other passion was to revegetate this uh, marginal farmland in Laramie County with uh, permanent vegetation. So, oh, you know, back in the 90s, I had uh, planted a grass nursery here to uh, see what, what species were most adapted for revegetation. The native vegetation is very slow. It would be the, it would be preferable, but it's uh, very expensive, the seed's expensive, and the time it takes to revegetate land is slow because the, or the carbon, the organic matter has been depleted out of this farmland from about 3% organic matter down to 1% organic matter. So I think that's uh, the primary reason, that's my observation anyway, that revegetating with, uh, with uh, native species is so slow, so I um, pursued this. Uh, the avenue that I pursued was revegetating with a mix of introduced grasses and a legume or two and a couple of native species to get vegetation back on the ground so that then you restore the ability to capture snow. We lose 25% of our effective precipitation in Wyoming sublimation of snow of flakes try mm. to get that snow back on the ground and capture it quick get it on the surface and also intercept 
uh, raindrops and infiltrate them, at that point, you're really not um, subject to downstream lawsuits for trying to uh, restore hydrology in, in, in your soil. And so that's, um, mm -hmm. that was my, has been my approach in this county. Uh, hmm. I think it was mentioned earlier, I vegetated over 10,000 acres. And then I think if you I provide technical assistance uh, over the years on um, uh, over 50,000 acres between Colorado and Nebraska and Wyoming. So that was my approach. It didn't leave, uh, you know, it didn't leave me open or the landowner open to uh, liability. Uh, just tried to restore mm -hmm. infiltration through interception of rain and snow capture. And I, that's what oh. I've done. That actually, um, you're in a totally different environment than I am in the Northwest California, but I've also worked on food forests and other projects uh, that are partially funded by tribes around us. And uh, their interest is in, uh, in native restoration, which I am too. And then I, but uh, really what I've tried to, to, to find a, a, a niche with is um, where natives can actually benefit or, and, or at the very least coexist with other you know, commonly profitable like tree crops and other things where, so um, my own land, I'm, pro I'm planting hundreds of fruit trees and nut trees on the south sides of the, of the regenerating native forests um, on, on barren ground. And essentially sounds, I'm basically trying to do the same thing with trees that you're doing with grasses. So it makes me feel like I might be doing something right. Yeah, and uh, I, of course, I, I was uh, born in Woolets, uh, so I don't know where you live, but... Oh. So I, I understand above Hayuchi. Okay, and yeah, I mean, uh, big problem in uh, California. Of course, it, it goes clear back to, um, you know, Spanish. When the Spanish controlled uh, that area, they, it was just overgrazed so much that your perennial forages have been replaced by annual forages in, in California for the most part, and. So you already have that huge um, change in vegetation in California. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's a tough one to overcome. It takes a major disturbance to break out of that um, when you have an uh, in, invasive an, annual species, it's tough to get back to perennials without another massive, um, massive disturbance. So that's basically what I've done here is uh, replaced annuals with perennials through cultivation. So sometimes you go backwards a step before you go forward too, but um, mm -hmm. I'd, be glad, I'd be glad to work with you uh, if, if I can. I do understand the environment that you live in. Oh, that's great. Um, and um, yeah, I've, I've definitely had to do that in some of very uh, just it's actually a place with excess of water uh, where you get 80 acre feet of water running off of hardscapes onto this food forest site. And uh, I did have to go backwards. Like the only things that would grow at first were daikon radish and uh, in this place that used to have 12 foot thick Sitka spruce and, and redwoods just inland of it, but it would grow nothing but weeds at best and mint. And, uh, and, and then I had to start with these really tough annuals and um, uh also found spreading bird seed was seemed to be pretty effective in terms of getting uh, just a little bit of life moving on the site. Um, and they, a lot of those sprouted and regenerated. And then, um, well, actually on that site, we've got quite a few native birds coming back and nesting. So um, it seems, you know, after five years to, to be really starting to turn a corner. <clears throat> and uh, I think that's just a really great way to look at it is to think about vegetation is doing the work and it's really hard to litigate revegetation. Uh, right. So, thanks. You bet. Nice. Well, thanks everybody. It's been a whew, great session today. That's that was awesome hearing this case. I mean, you see how much it applies to everything. It's like why is is recharging groundwater through you know like building ponds demonized by the government and yet pumping groundwater in unlimited supplies allowed? This seems like a huge crime <laughs> so thank you guys you for work for with us to change, to change the law yeah <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge opportunity too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys want to give us some final thoughts, Reba and James? Thanks, Ben. Okay. Well, I mean, what I got out of this was really the realization that we're going to have to build a relationship with our state agencies because this this battle can't go on forever. Um, so that is what I'm going to take back to my people and and say we've got to figure out a way to reach out to the state engineer to come up with some a different a different way. And um, that's. I, that's what I took from that. So I'm really glad that I got some direction for what, what I'm going to do next out of this. What about you, Jim? Oh, I thought this was very good. To, it just kind of gave us a chance to actually verbalize what we've been doing for the last several years and, and, uh, and get some response. So that was very valuable for me. And I, I appreciate this platform. Um, I just have always, I, I, as quick as possible, I just, I lived uh, much of my life in places where there just wasn't um, good potable water. And so I always, so when I came to Laramie County, I mean, even when I lived in uh, Northern California, we, uh, we lived in kind of a, a hilly country there east of Woolitz and we had a spring that we protected, you know, with our lives because it was the only source of water for quite some distance. You just couldn't drill well there at all. And I've been in places, uh, you know, and when, uh, when I was in Cuba, we used uh, seawater converted, you know, and uh, in Vietnam, I don't know what I was drinking. I, I, I hate to think about that. So I, I, have a, I have plenty of experience with periods of time without having access to good water. And much of, and much of the world is in that situation every day now. And that's what, when I came to Laramie County and I just had this on my farm here, I have a well for my house and to have this valuable clean water for me is just probably my uh, most valuable possession actually. So that's kind of the background that I have. So anyway, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you both. Yeah, that was really wonderful. Wonderful way to close it too. I mean, I think that's true for not just us humans, but all life on this planet. The fresh, clean water is the most valuable resource we have and we have to work together to protect it and really steward it for the future generations. And it'd be cool if, if your case succeeds, then we could start a legal water revolution everywhere in the States, which would be fantastic. Great, thank you. Everybody, well, that concludes this webinar and check your emails for the replay and join us on the Y Stories community.